Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we love you, Lord, and we are always grateful, Lord, to gather in your house, in your name. Uh, Lord, we need you, Lord, every single one of us, despite how long we have been serving you, whether we are new in the faith, maybe baby Christians, or whether we're seasoned saints that have been serving for many, many years, none of us have arrived. There is work that needs to be done in every one of our hearts, Lord God, and I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us tonight. Lord, we turn to your word because we recognize that everything that has been written is for a purpose, that we would learn from it, that we again would not make the mistakes of the past. Help us, Lord God, give us wisdom. Help us to understand the time and the day and age that we're living in, Lord God, that we would make sure that our hearts are right with you. Oh, Lord, meet with us, Lord God. We love you. We just, we look to you. I pray you would speak as only you can, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you guys tonight again. We begin a brand new book. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Micah. The book of Micah tonight again, kicking it off brand new again. Perfect time to be here tonight. I'm going to give you a thorough, as I always do, thorough introduction of the book. If you're looking for Micah, it is the sixth of the 12 minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. And so uh, book number six, we would say the book of Micah. Now, as you guys turn there, again, praying over the last several months, literally, as we were going through Proverbs, had such a blessed time, but excited about where the Lord would direct us. And, and one of the things that I began to recognize, and I'm sure you all agree with me, is that we are living in a time where there is so much taking place. I mean, there is news going on every single day. This world is changing so fast. And, and if we're honest, I think we'll agree that it's not changing for the better. Things are getting worse. Day after day, again, bad news after bad news. Now yesterday, literally just yesterday, a report came out which to me was, it was so sad. As a Christian, it should make you sad as a Christian. When we think about some of the great Bible teachers and theologians of the last several hundred years, they came out of Europe. They came out of England. And yet a report came out yesterday stating that for the first time in over 500 years, Christianity in the UK, in the United Kingdom, is no longer a majority religion. This place that was once on fire for God, think about the Protestant Reformation and everything that took place, is now in rapid decline. What happened? What's happening in the world again? What's happening with Christians in general? Well, the report, if you read it, went on to say this. It predicts that at the current rate of people abandoning the faith, that's what it said, that Christianity throughout the world will be a minority religion by the year 2045. Now, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening to the powerful church? What happened? What's happening, especially as we look out on our country and recognize that this country that was once founded on Judeo-Christian values, this country that influenced the world, we're seeing the same thing taking place. We are seeing ourselves just farther behind than Europe. And it's sad because as we look out at the Christian church today and we read the book of Acts, we wonder what happened. How come we're not seeing the same things that, that we once saw? How come we're not seeing the powerful influence that the church once had upon this unsaved world, specifically in our nation? Instead, if we're honest, what we are seeing is that instead of the church influencing the world, the world is influencing the church. That's what we're seeing. Let's be honest, right? With so many people. Well, I look at our nation again that supposedly is 60% Christian. At one time it was in the 80s and then the 70s. Now it's down to the 60s and declining. And you see again the, the, the powerlessness. We see the weakness of the church. And I wonder as God looks down what he thinks. The church is sick now. Again, it is no longer powerful. It is no longer influential. And all we can do is look at our hearts and look at our lives and ask the Lord, Lord, where am I at, right? It does no good to point the finger, but I wonder again how many Christians, even how many of us, 
are contaminated by the things of this world. Maybe we don't want to admit it, right? Maybe we won't say it in front of anybody. But how many of us, again, have grown lax, have become complacent in our Christian walks so that we are now, again, being influenced daily by the things of the world? Now, I challenged the men with this yesterday in our men's Bible study. And of course, just like tonight, no one's going to raise their hand and go, yeah, you're talking about me, Pastor. But one of the things that we can all recognize is all we have to do personally is look at our hearts. Look at where our focus is. Look at the things that we care about. Look where we spend our time, our energy, and even our money. And it speaks loud and clear. Are we the spiritual Christians living like Jesus that God has called us to be? Or have we become worldly Christians? And that is so sad. Again, it's not for anyone to point the finger. It is simply for us to examine our lives and to wonder, are we part of the problem with the weakness and the powerlessness of the church? Or are we the exception? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Again, that's exactly what we are talking about. How many of you would agree with me that from the very beginning, God in His goodness has declared to us exactly what He expects? Isn't that right? We recognize there's no excuses, right? God is crystal clear. He tells us what he expects of us. He tells us what he desires of us. He tells us exactly where to worship him, how to worship him. God is crystal clear in what he expects. And yet, even though most Christians know these things, how many of us are not doing what we know we're supposed to do? And instead, we find ourselves not doing the things that God desires us to do. You know, Satan, and we just talked about this right on Sunday, Satan can't possess Christians. All he can do, right, is whisper in our ear. All he can do is try to tempt us and try to influence us from the outside. But how many of us give in? We allow ourselves, right? We do it to ourselves, even knowing what God expects. And we allow ourselves to be contaminated by the things of this world. What we're going to see tonight are the consequences that come when the people of God willingly allow themselves to be contaminated by the ungodly world around them. There's always consequences, right? We will reap what we sow, even as the the children of God, and I'll even say this, God expects more from His children. To whom much is given, much is required. And so if we, again are allowing the world to influence us, allowing our hearts, our souls, our minds to be contaminated by the things of this world. It's worse in God's eyes because we know better. And because we know better, we will pay the price if we do not deal with our sin. Our sin will deal with us. Now, as I always do, as I begin a brand new book, I'm going to give you an an introduction And I specifically take the time to to give you some facts, some information that you need to know. It's going to help you understand the book. These are things that, for the most part, are not going to be covered in the text. This is history. This is information that you need to know. If you're taking notes, again, this is good stuff. I love taking notes. The author of the the book, as we will see, is a man by the name of Micah. Okay? The name Micah is a shortened form of the word Micaiah or Michael. This is where the word comes from. It means who is like the Lord. Micah was from the town of Moresheth. It was a farm town in the foothills of the southern kingdom of Judah, located 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. It bordered Philistia which was the land of the Philistines. Micah ministered during the reigns of three different kings, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Okay, Which means, if you're taking notes, that he ministered somewhere between the years 739 to 686 BC. His ministry began after the prophets Isaiah and Hosea began their ministries. Okay, we'll talk about that a little more. But unlike Isaiah that focused 
on the southern kingdom, and Hosea that focused on the northern kingdom, Micah prophesied to both kingdoms. Remember, during this time, the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms. Micah prophesied to both the northern and the southern. If you're taking notes, the theme of the book is justice will be served. You can write that down. Justice will be served. Now, to give you a little background on the timing, if you remember from the book of Isaiah, because remember, Micah followed up Isaiah. He was right after Isaiah. The children of Israel during this time was experiencing their greatest time of peace and prosperity, second only to the time under King Solomon. Politically, their enemies had been defeated or were too busy fighting other nations, which allowed the the children of Israel to reclaim the land that they had lost and to strengthen their borders and rebuild their nation. Economically, the nation prospered. They were able to reclaim trade routes they had lost. Commerce returned and trade with peace and security. They were able to grow their crops. The nation once again began to flourish, bringing wealth back to the people of Israel. As a result, an upper class emerged. Expensive homes were built, and the rich began living lives of luxury. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. But one of the things that happens to people when they become rich is they lose focus on what is truly important. And so often, money clouds the judgment so that people end up caring more about their money than they do other people. And that's exactly what began to take place here. Remember that when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, the land was divvied up amongst the the, the tribes of Israel. That was forever. That was to be their land forever. But even though that's what the law stipulated, when the wealthy became greedy and no longer continued following the Lord, they began buying off smaller farms. They began acquiring other property. Why? So that they can become more rich. They had no concern or care for the people. The rich became richer. The poor became poorer. And for that reason, justice in the land began to suffer. Social justice began, injustice began to take place. Again, amongst the poor, with the rich only thinking about themselves and even taking advantage of those they viewed as underneath them. That would bring about further spiritual corruption. Remember, God in His Word has made it crystal clear how He desires that we worship Him, even where He desires that we worship Him. And remember back then, specifically in the Old Testament, God called His people to come to the temple and to worship Him. Isn't that right? This was God's heart. This is God's desire. But the northern kingdom, because originally they were, had a civil war with the southern kingdom, they did not want their people going to the southern kingdom to worship God. And so they built their own temple. How about that? They built two different locations. They uh, created uh, bulls that would be worshipped their, by their people. And it was sad. No longer would the people of the north travel to the temple to worship God as God had desired. And even those in the southern kingdom, even though on the holidays, on the holy days, as many people, right, will worship God on the holy days, they went and did their religious duty. But what they began to do, because it was too inconvenient to go all the way to the temple, It was too inconvenient, right, to do what God had asked them to do. They desired to stay home instead to worship God. Doesn't that sound like today? That's what they began to do. It was too far to go to the temple. Forget that. We can just stay home and worship God here. And they began to build altars in their backyards, on the high places, on the hills, on the mountains. And they decided there that they would worship God. This began in the northern kingdom, and it filtered down into the southern kingdom as well. They also began to look at the Canaanite people around them, 
who worshipped in different ways. They, we would say it this way, believed that you could have your cake and eat it too, right? You could worship your God however you wanted to worship your God. And they began to look at that and desire to do the same thing. Some of the religious practices, and we've covered this in detail before, with some of these religions, is they would believe that you could engage in adultery, engage in fornication. They had prostitution that was all done in the name of religion as they would have these practices where they would worship these gods and they bow down to idols and they would be able to live and do whatever they wanted to do. And it was all condoned. And so the children of Israel, influenced by those Canaanite people, began to do the same thing. But one of the things we have to remember, and we have to remember even today as Christians, is that when or as the people of God, we are in a spiritual covenant with God. Isn't that right? That means we are married to God. We're married to God. So for any of us to turn our back in, on God and to have pursue false gods or false religions or anything of that matter, we are committing spiritual adultery against our God. And this is exactly what was taking place back then. And the sad thing is, because life was good, because they were prospering, because their crops were growing, because they were becoming more wealthy, they assumed, and that's always dangerous, that God must be blessing them. That everything was good because life is good. And so they continued to do whatever it was that they wanted to do when we know that was not the case. What's well, for this reason that the Lord raised up Micah. Okay? Micah. And he sends Micah with a prophecy. And the purpose of the prophecy is to warn the people of God about the judgment to come. Michael will call upon the people to repent of their sin, to turn back to God, and to obey his word. And he will also speak out against their treatment of their fellow brothers and sisters, specifically the poor and the needy. Because remember God's greatest commandments, right? That we are to love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and to do what? To love our neighbor as ourself. This is what Micah is going to declare, calling the people to get right, turn from their sin, repent before it's too late. The question is, will they listen? Okay? Will they listen? That's what we're about to find out as we cover the book of Micah. Tonight, again, if you're taking notes, we're gonna, I'm going to give you an introduction right, to the book as we cover the first chapter. We're going to look at Micah chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. We are going to read about the coming judgment of Israel and Judah. The coming judgment of Israel and Judah. And the first thing we'll look into is the prophet's pronouncement. Okay, The prophet's pronouncement. I hope you're taking notes to help you remember. Let's pick it up here. Verse 1, chapter 1, book of Micah. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah which he, which Micah, saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now Micah begins, like most of the other prophets, by declaring that what he is about to say is a word from God. He recognized what he was given was from the Lord, with God likely showing him in a vision what Micah was about to declare. God showed Micah the spiritual condition of the people of God and how sad they were living. And because of their sin, the consequences they would soon face if they did not repent. Now, as I mentioned, Micah is going to prophesy to both kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And it begins here. Notice that it's concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And Micah specifically, notice, calls out the capitals. And the question is, why? Why didn't he just say to the southern kingdom, to the northern kingdom? 
Well, most scholars believe that Micah singled out the capitals for two key reasons. Number one, because it was in the capitals that the rulers and the leaders of the nations lived. We all know that a nation rises and falls with the leadership. Isn't that right? Here, God had given the leaders, the kings, that position, that platform. And their job was to lead the people, to be the examples, right? As every leader is to be an example. That was their role, to lead the people, to worship God. But instead, they condoned sin. Instead, they led the people into sin. And so number one, Micah calls out the capital because that was their residence, right? It's like calling out Washington, D.C. That's exactly what Micah did. The second reason is that the capital cities, of course, represent the two kingdoms. It represents the nations. And the sin that was taking place in these cities represented the sins that were taking place throughout the rest of of the two kingdoms. Now again, as I read this, I can't help but think about our nation today. Isn't this us? Corruption? Sinfulness? This is exactly what we're seeing today with the failure of our governing leaders to pass laws that promote goodness and righteousness in the land, that promote fairness and justice Instead, what are we seeing? Our own government legalizing wickedness, legalizing sin, so that instead of promoting godly living, what are they doing? They're promoting sinfulness. They're basically encouraging everyone to sin. And they are the ones responsible for our nation, right? For the downfall of our nation, which is eventually going to destroy us, okay? And eventually is going to destroy us. How many of us, again, we've asked this question, we've covered the book of Revelation, and we've read the whole thing and found out that the United States is not there. Now we scratch our head because think about it. The United States is the most powerful and prosperous nation in the history of the whole world. And yet it's not there doesn't exist as far as the book of Revelation is concerned. And many scholars for centuries have questioned why. And we know what the reason is, right? Because we're either destroyed by then. We have destroyed ourselves. We have imploded. Or we are so powerless, we are so weak, that we are no longer a world power. We no longer have any influence in the world, which is why we're not even mentioned in the book of Revelation. It is so sad for this country that was once so powerful and great. But again, all we have to do is look at our leaders. And you know what's the worst part about that? We elect our leaders. We elect our leaders. And we are sadly getting what we deserve. That is sad. I love our country. I thank God. There's no place else I would rather live. And how sad that we are getting what we deserve. We we have chosen our leaders. And all we got to do is look out, right? Whether it be Washington, D.C., whether it be Los Angeles or Hollywood or San Francisco, right? Las Vegas, New York City, the list goes on. Those key cities have the most ungodliness, don't they? But how sad that the rest of the nation wants to be like Hollywood. The rest of the nation wants to be like San Francisco. The rest of the nation is just following suit, which is why we are seeing what we are seeing take place in our country today. And sadly, all it's going to do is bring about the judgment of God. Keep reading. Verse 2. Micah says, here, if you have a pen, underline here, here. You peoples, all of you, everybody, pay attention. O earth and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now what Michael, Micah does, it's really cool, is that he's going to speak with a courtroom scene in his mind. 
And so as we read what we're reading, you got to imagine the courtroom scene. How many of you know that when the judge walks into the courtroom, everything gets quiet, right? Everyone needs to pay attention. Everyone all rise, right? And everyone needs to listen to the judge. And that's exactly what Micah is calling upon. Notice, he's calling upon everybody. All the people of the earth, everybody in the world needs to listen. Pay attention to what is happening, to what is about to take place. And the picture here is that God steps forward now. And God is about to testify, how sad, against his own people. God is about to testify against Samaria and Jerusalem. God is. He's about to testify against his own people, his own children. They are the defendants. And God is going to find them guilty because they are guilty. Notice, let the Lord God be a witness. Let him testify against you, his own people, for their sin and disobedience. God is going to render judgment. Now what's so powerful about this is understand what Micah is doing. Micah is calling upon the unsaved world to pay attention that God is testifying against his own children. Now that's amazing, isn't it? Why do you think Micah wants the whole world to see this? Because he wants the world to know that God disciplines his own. God doesn't let anyone get away with sin. Okay, Not even his children. God doesn't turn a blind eye and let his kids get away with murder. It doesn't work that way. God is so fair. God is so just that God is about to make an example out of his children. He is going to discipline and punish his children as a lesson to the whole wide world that no one is going to get away with anything. No one. Think about it. If God's not going to let his own kids get away with anything, do you think he's going to let his, the ungodly world get away with anything? No way. And this is exactly what Micah is calling upon them to understand. What's interesting is God is so good and God is so fair that not only does God punish his own kids, but he punishes his kids first. First. Before he even deals with the ungodly, he will deal with us. And we better get that. One of the mistakes, again, Christians make today is they think that because we're saved, we think because you said a prayer, you think because you're a Christian and you come to church, that somehow God's going to let you get away with your sin. It doesn't work that way. If anything, God is going to make an example out of us to show the world that's not the way he operates. He is fair. He is just. He will deal with sin. Now, for the unsaved, when they see this, when they catch the lesson, it is meant to show them, man, if God doesn't play around with his kids, oh, he ain't going to play around with me. And this is meant to drive them again to repent and to get right with God. Verse 3, For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will mount under him. The valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Now, if you remember from our study of the books of the kings, and we did this a couple years ago, although the northern kingdom and the southern kingdoms both had ungodly kings, ungodly kings that turned the people away from the Lord, the southern kingdom had some good kings. And the awesome thing that took place in the southern kingdom is that every once in a while, even though they had the majority of wicked and sinful and selfish kings, God would raise up a godly king to lead the people back. That happened in the southern kingdom of Judah. But in the northern kingdom, they never had one good king. Every single king was wicked, which meant 
that their decline, their spiritual decline, happened so much faster than the southern kingdom. They were so far, so, so far along in their sin, unlike the southern kingdom that every once in a while turned back to the Lord. And it's for this reason, because the northern kingdom was so far farther along in their sin, that judgment would begin with them first. God's judgment would begin with the northern kingdom of Israel. And that's what he says in verse 5. Notice, all this, all of what is about to take place, is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. You guys might remember that Jacob had his name changed to Israel. Okay? And so all of this, right, all of what we read in verses 3 and 4, the Lord coming down and bringing his judgment upon the land was going to begin in the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay? That's where it would begin. And notice, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not in Samaria? That's, where, that's the capital. That's where it's most responsible. And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Now, one of the big sins of the northern kingdom is that not only did they choose to sin and rebel against God, but sadly, they influenced the southern kingdom to follow in their footsteps. Now, if there's something that we learn as Christians, we learn this as Christians. God calls us to be examples. And if we lead or influence other people to sin, God is also going to hold us accountable for that. And so God is going to get Israel. They are going to be judged again for their own sin, but also because they influenced the southern kingdom to follow in their footsteps. Look for six. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country a place of planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. Here, before it even took place, Micah prophesied the coming judgment of the capital city of Samaria. That one day soon, it would literally, it was a beautiful city. Historians, archaeologists describe how it was a beautiful city on a mountain. And yet today, if you go to Israel, you can visit Samaria. And all that is left is ruins. Just as God declared, it would be turned into a trash heap. Everything in it would be crushed to pieces and burned with fire. God was going to do this again for their rebellion, for their disobedience. But remember, for their spiritual adultery. They began to follow after the ungodly people. They began to worship false gods. They began to bow down to false idols. All of which, again, would be broken into pieces. God would make sure the whole place was destroyed. And also, remember, because they began to engage in adultery and fornication with these temple priestesses, with these temple prostitutes. That's exactly what he talks about in the last verse. He says that they paid a, they paid a fee to the prostitute. Here the prostitute would come, they would engage in sexual immorality, and they would pay the prostitute an offering that she would take back to the temple. How ugly, how wicked. But again, they did this because they wanted to worship. They knew they needed to be religious, but they wanted to do it their own way. And so God says, the fee that they paid the prostitute would that fee would be taken and shall return back again to those Canaanites, to those ungodly people. And it's a picture. You imagine that an army would invade, would destroy Samaria, destroy all their idols, but they would take the silver and gold and they would take it back home to their land where they would use that same money to engage in their immorality. They would pay their own temple prostitutes so that they could worship their false gods. How sad. 
true to the prophecy. History tells us, right? Literally just a few years later, just as he declared, the city of Samaria was destroyed by the Assyrian army in 722 B.C. With the survivors, along with the gold and silver of Samaria, taken back to Assyria. Here these people, they didn't get it. Here these people wanted to worship false gods, and God said, okay, okay. I will let you become captive by an ungodly army who will take you back and you can worship their gods there as you find yourself in slavery for the rest of your life. God gave them what they wanted. They wanted to worship false gods. God says, okay, I'll allow that to take place. I'll allow you to be taken back where you can worship those false gods. Now, what struck me again as I'm reading, as I'm studying, as we covered this before, how many of you remember that so many of the prophecies that took place in the Old Testament were precursors of what God said he will do in ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament. Isn't that right? How many of us know that one day the Lord's coming back? He is going to come from his throne. That's what it says, right? We just read that. He is going to step forward from his throne. And he's going to come to the earth, and what's he going to do? He's going to, he's going to destroy the earth, isn't he? And he is going to remove, he is going to remove all of the ungodly from the earth, isn't he? Because he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And I think how interesting, just as he prophesied he would destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and remove the people from the land, his own people, One day he's coming back, according to the book of Revelation, he's going to destroy the earth, and he's going to remove the ungodly from the land. The same exact thing is going to take place in greater fulfillment when the Lord returns. Let's move on. Second thing. After the prophet's pronouncement, how about the prophet's reaction? The prophet's reaction. Verse 8. For this, I, Micah says, will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. Now what's so amazing about this is Micah is describing to us how he felt. God had shown him something in a vision about what was going to take place again to his own people. And now he describes how he felt. He describes how The prophecy caused him to react. Now, Micah understood that his people were going to reap the consequences of their sin. God wasn't being a meanie. They deserve this. They chose to rebel against God. They chose to live in sin, even though they were the people of God. And so Micah knew this. But even though he knew they were simply going to reap the consequences that they deserved... His heart broke when he considered the judgment of God that they would face. And he describes lamentation, mourning, crying, his heart being broken, right? He talks about, look back what he says, making lamentation like a jackal. It's a picture of a wolf mourning at night. We know that picture, right? Howling. He describes mourning like an ostrich, crying, making noise when he recognized how sad his own people, people he knew, people he loved, that were going to face the judgment of God. It caused him to break down emotionally so that what did he do? He tore off his clothes and walked around naked as a sign of grief. Now I want to ask you something because this is what I had to come to terms with. The Lord Jesus is coming back soon. I I hope we we believe that. But how many of the people that we know and love are going to be left behind? How many people that we know and love, come on guys, are going to face the ugly things that we read about in the book of Revelation? We hated the last couple years with the lockdowns. And the mandates and, and, you know, our freedoms taken away, that's nothing compared to what's going to happen when the Antichrist shows up. This world is truly going to be 
miserable, intolerable. And yet, how many of us have loved ones, and we're not judging, we're just being honest, that are going to live through the tribulation? Even those that call themselves Christians, but they're not saved. And they're going to suffer living through the tribulation. Does that bother us? Do we care? Or do we have the attitude, I got my ticket to heaven, hey, you know, who cares about anybody else? Because we see here how we should feel. We should feel like, like Micah felt. Our hearts should break when we think about our, our neighbors and our coworkers and our classmates. Maybe our friends and relatives that aren't saved. And if you believe the word of God, you understand, again, it literally is going to be hell on earth and they're going to have to live through that. And that should, that should break our heart. It should affect us. It should cause us, again, to live differently. It should cause us to care and to want to do something about it. One of the interesting things that I've seen, not only as a pastor, but I've seen it in my whole Christianity, is there are certain people that get so excited, right, with end times prophecy. That's it. Pastor, when are you going to teach the book of Ezekiel, right? When are you going to teach Daniel? When are you going to teach Revelation, right? So excited about the future. So excited about the end times. But do we understand the main purpose that God has shared with us, His plans for the future, is not to stimulate us mentally, but to break our hearts emotionally. It's not just for the brain. It's for the heart. And if we understand this, again, if we really care we should be willing, again, to live differently. We should desire to make a difference and, and do what we can to make sure we get as many people to heaven as possible. Someone say amen to that, right? That should be our heart. But look how sad. Verse 9. He goes on. For her wound is incurable. Her wound is incurable. Now what's interesting about this is that word incurable. How many of you believe that if the northern kingdom would have repented prior to God's judgment coming, that God would have forgave them. How many of you believe that? I believe that, right? Nineveh repented and God spared them from judgment, didn't he? And so I believe God would have forgiven them if, and that's the big if, if they would have repented. But it's interesting because Micah tells us that her wound is incurable in other words it's irreversible and you have to wonder why Micah stated that it was irreversible and the reason it was irreversible is because Micah realized that the people of the northern kingdom even though they claimed to be the people of God right even though they were Jews they were so wrapped up in their sinful lives they were so deep in sin that they were too far gone. They were too far gone. And we've talked about this before, that God in His goodness keeps reaching out to us, doesn't He? Calling the unsaved, calling the unbeliever to come. And He calls us, and He calls us, and He calls us. But He won't force us. But what happens? When we begin to tell God no, right? No, God. Tomorrow, God. Maybe later, God. And we begin to tune God's voice out, right? Because we don't want to hear Him because we don't want to listen. And we continue to tune God's voice out. Eventually, we get to a place where our heart has become so hard that we don't hear the voice of God anymore. And once we get to that stage, once we can no longer hear the voice of God because we no longer feel the conviction of His Holy Spirit, we're too far gone. It's over now. It's too late. We would say we have reached the point of no return. Now someone might ask me, when is that? Where's that line? What, you know, when does that take place? I don't know, but God knows. He knows. And in His mercy, because He loves us, because He desires to save us instead of judges, He keeps reaching out. He keeps calling us, right? And we've all felt that. I remember feeling that, right? Before I was saved. 
Filling the Holy Spirit, call me and convict me of my sin. I knew what God wanted me, me to do, but I still wanted to party. I still wanted to do what I want to do. And I thank God so much that I finally responded, right? That God drew me to him and granted me repentance. Because eventually, again, God's no respecter of persons. And eventually it will be too late. And that's exactly what took place with the northern kingdom. Let me remind you that prior to Micah, God had sent the northern kingdom Elijah. He had sent them Elisha. He had sent them Amos. He had sent them Hosea. And he had sent them Isaiah. How about that? He had given them opportunity. Chance after chance. Prophet after prophet, right? We would say message after message, calling them to repent, turn back from their sin. But they didn't want to listen. And so eventually, they reached a place where it was too late. And so now God raised up Micah to tell them just that. You're done. Judgment is coming. It's too late. You had your opportunity. This message then was judgment against Israel, the northern kingdom, in hopes that Judah, the southern kingdom, would learn and repent before they too faced judgment. A similar judgment. Look what it says. Keep reading verse 9. And it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Again, although the northern kingdom was about to be destroyed, in his mercy, God would spare the southern kingdom the same fate. He would use them as an example. If they would listen, if they would repent, after witnessing the destruction that was about to fall. But even though the capital city of Jerusalem would escape judgment, they would still be invaded. Much of the nation of the southern kingdom would be destroyed. In fact, the enemy army of the Assyrians would make it all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. And by the time they got that far, they would have wiped out several other cities. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And so even the southern kingdom would face consequences. Which brings us to the third thing. The prophet's warning. Okay? The prophet's warning. Verse 10. Tell it not in gath. Weep not at all. Now it's really beautiful is through the rest of the chapter, these last seven verses, Micah gets very poetic. That's literally what he does. Very poetic. In the Hebrew language, what Micah begins to do is he uses a series of puns. A pun is a play on words. A play on words, again. And he does this with the cities of the southern kingdom, specifically 10 cities within the southern kingdom. But he begins speaking about the city of Gath. What was Gath? Well, Gath was in Philistia. It was on the border of the place where Micah was from. Okay? Remember, the Philistines were the enemies of the children of Israel. And so God just declared that his judgment was going to fall even upon the southern kingdom of Judah. Many of those cities are going to be wiped out. And so Micah says, don't nobody tell Gath. Don't tell our enemies about what is about to happen. How many of you know one of the saddest things to take place is when an unsaved person hears that a Christian is being punished for their sin. How sad is that, right? We should have been the people of God. We should have been the example. And yet God has to punish us. God has to deal with us. How sad when the ungodly hear about that. How they laugh and they mock at Christians. And the same thing again was about to take place. The enemies of Israel, the Philistines, would laugh when the people of God were being judged. Now remember, Micah uses wordplay. And the word gath, the word gath is similar to the Hebrew word tell, T-E, 
Al Al. And so notice what he says. Tell it not in tell. Okay? He's using wordplay. He's telling them, don't let anyone tell the Philistines because they will laugh when we begin to experience the judgment of God for our sins. They will laugh and rejoice at our suffering. Keep reading. In Bethlehem, roll yourselves in the dust. Again, more wordplay. The word Aphra sounds like the Hebrew word dust. And so he says, in the town that's known as dust, you're going to turn into dust. You can roll yourself in the dust as you mourn of the coming judgment. Verse 11, pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The city of Shafir sounded like the word beautiful in Hebrew. In other words, that beautiful city is no longer going to be beautiful anymore as you will mourn in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zanan do not come out. The word Zanan sounds like the Hebrew word exit or go out. And so he says, the inhabitants of go out do not come out. Okay, It's a word play. In other words, although you're known to be outgoing, when your enemy comes, you're not going to be able to go anywhere. You're going to be confined in your town until they destroy you. Keep reading. The lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away from you its standing place. The word Ezel means nearby city. And he declares that when the army of judgment comes, no one nearby is going to be able to help you, and you're not going to be able to help anyone nearby. Verse 12. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. The name Maroth means bitterness, and it describes the bitterness the people will feel when they experience judgment. Verse 13, harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. The word Lachish sounds like the Hebrew word to the horses, right? Go to the horses. And what he's declaring is that they will need to go to their horses, but it won't benefit them because they too will face the judgment. They will not escape. Verse 14, Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. This was Micah's hometown. And it sounds like the Hebrew word for betrothed, a gift that you would give to a brand new bride, a dowry. And the idea is this town would be given over like a dowry to the invading army. The houses of Achib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. Achib sounds like the Hebrew word for deceitful or disappointing. Here again, they would think that this city would be able to fight off the army. But looks are deceiving because they would be a disappointment for Israel. Verse 15, I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Merishah. Merishah is related to the Hebrew word for possessor, with Micah declaring that the invading army would possess this city. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Adullam, interesting enough, was the place where King David fled, or before he was a king, from King Saul in Samuel 23, 13. It was a place where he had to run and hide. And it's Micah declaring that once again, the people of Israel would have to run for their lives. They would have to hide from this invading army to the city of Adullam. Last verse. Make yourselves bald. In other words, cut off your hair. For the children of your delight, make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. Because all of this would take place, and it did take place 20 years later in the year 701 BC, after conquering the northern kingdom of Israel, the Assyrian army invaded the southern kingdom of Judah, destroying 46 cities and making it all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. You find this in 2 Kings chapter 18. If you remember the story, 
had it not been for God sending an angel to wipe out the Assyrian army, which the angel did, wiping out 185,000 Assyrians in one night, Jerusalem would have been conquered as well. But God spared them, spared the city of Jerusalem, the capital city, giving the people of the southern kingdom an opportunity to repent, to recognize again, judgment had already fallen and it will fall upon them if they do not get right. The question is again, would they listen? Would they learn? Would they pay attention to what the prophet was declaring? We'll pick it up next week in chapter 2. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord God, for your word. Lord, so powerful, Lord God. So much information, Lord God, that we can glean from, that we can learn from. Help us, Lord God, even as your children, to learn from the things that have been written, to learn even from the judgments that you brought upon your own people, Lord God, as a lesson to the whole wide world that whoever partakes in sin, Lord God, will suffer the consequences. No one gets away with anything, Lord God, not even your children. Oh, Lord, teach us these lessons. Help us, Lord God, motivate us, Lord God, not only to consider our own standing with you, Lord, but even to have love and compassion for the lost world around us, especially those that are closest to us. Help us to redeem the time. Help us to recognize that we are living in the last days, Lord God, that we would live different lives, Lord God, motivated to reach the lost. Motivated, Lord, to draw closer to you, to truly be the people that you were called us to be. Lord, we love you, Lord God. Fill us with your spirit. Continue to do the work that only you're doing. Lord, draw back the backslider. Bring salvation, Lord God, to those that need it, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, guys. Nice.